What's up, YouTube trucking community? Sean Cahalen, Christian Brother Trucker, coming at you with another video. And as promised, today we are going to be talking about the differences of different modes of trucking. Today we're going to be talking about dry van versus reefer unit. Well, what's the difference? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Both are a box. Both of them look the same, but they do have very huge differences and your experiences driving each one will be vastly different. Although they look the same on the outside, the only real difference that you notice about reefer units is, is that they look a little bit different and there is a big old engine or compartment on the front of a reefer unit. Other than that, they're both 53 foot long. They're both a big box and they both have slidable tandems and pretty much everything about them is on the outside looks to be exactly the same so there are a lot of similarities but there are huge differences with operating a reefer unit versus pulling a dry van and i'm going to get into the vast differences and what what and how they're different and how they affect you as a driver I'm also going to talk about the differences between being a company driver versus being a lease operator versus being an owner operator. Believe it or not, there are huge differences in the pay structure and how it affects you as a driver uh, will be vastly different between those modes. So we're going to dive in and we're going to talk about all of these differences. And we're also going to talk about a little side note that my wife brought up to me. Uh, because my wife is uh, a part of Truckers Wives. It's a group on Facebook and she follows them and, and uh, in that group it's a bunch of, tr a bunch of Truckers Wives that uh, have a little community on Facebook and she's a part of that, which I think is amazing. I think we should have little community groups that we're involved with. So, let's dive right in. If you're new to trucking and you're thinking about dry van and you're thinking about reefer, this video could help you out a lot. And if you're driving a dry van, looking over at the reefer units and thinking that life could be better, well, after I give you all this information, you make that decision. I can tell you my personal opinions, but I can only speak for myself. And I am gonna tell you my experiences and ultimately don't take my word for anything. Try it out yourself. And don't let me ruin this experience for you if you're thinking about going over and driving those really nice looking reefer units. But we're going to talk about the differences and we're going to talk about the possible, how, how it could affect you as a driver. All right, let's dig right in, shall we? So, the major differences in dry van and reefer unit are <clears throat> different markets, different freight, and different equipment with the with the reefer unit you are going to have to uh run reefer fuel what's reefer fuel well if you don't know reefer fuel is well let's start at the beginning and, and describe the differences of uh, of a um of a reefer unit versus a dry van what, what's the difference okay so a reefer unit is a refrigerated box insulated the walls are insulated and there is a big huge ingersoll rand or some other type of smaller diesel engine that is attached to the nose and it is a big huge freezer box that has a refrigeration unit and that diesel engine that sits on the nose cone of that trailer powers a big giant air conditioner and it literally can cool or heat believe it or not, your reefer box. You can set it up to warm the inside or you can set it up to cold, cool the inside and you can set it up to freeze. So you can haul frozen products, you can haul chilled products or you can even keep the box warm in the winter time if you need to. <clears throat> so both of them have slidable tandems so that you can adjust the weight according to what's being loaded inside the trailer and the massive difference is is you cannot haul as much weight in a reefer unit because of the refrigeration unit and the engine that is on the nose cone of that trailer so 
if you can haul on average about 45, 40, 46,000 pounds on a dry van, you can only haul approximately, and I'm not getting into specific numbers here, uh, approximately around 40,000 to 42,000 versus 40, 46, 47 on a dry box. The reason why is because of course that big old diesel engine and refrigeration unit that is sitting on the nose of that trailer so your drive axles are going to be heavier by a couple thousand pounds so working with the weight is going to be a little bit more difficult and um of course you know depending on where you're going california and i think florida and maybe michigan um, there's certain tandem settings that you're going to have to mess with and you're really going to have to dial that weight in. And they love to load them down as heavy as they possibly can. So those are the major differences. Everything else about them is the same. They handle the same. You slide the tandems the same. Maneuvering is the same. Backing into slots is the same. Parking, all of that fun stuff. Maneuvering, that's all the same. So that's pretty much the major differences. The additional fueling that you have to mess with on a reefer unit, there's about a 50 to 75 gallon uh, fuel tank that is attached underneath the trailer that runs uh, off-road diesel. Um, a lot of places will run, um, you know, when you go to the fuel pump and you, and you swipe your card and it asks you if you want regular diesel, reefer, and F. Well, if you're running a reefer unit, you're going to have to get all three if you're driving a brand new truck. So you're gonna have to fuel up your truck and then you're gonna have to fuel up your def and then you're gonna have to pull up and then you're gonna have to switch the pump over to off-road diesel. <clears throat> they used to run off-road red dye diesel. Uh, a lot of these places uh, don't carry that stuff anymore, but what it is is it's taxed differently because it's not taxed with road tax. And so the price of reefer fuel usually is about a dollar fifty to two dollars cheaper than regular on-road diesel fuel and i don't know whether or not they still put red dye in there to tell uh, they put this specific red dye in off-road diesel that could be tested and if you ever ran off-road diesel in your on-road truck you are basically committing tax fraud and if you got caught doing that you would you would suffer severe fines if you were caught doing that so just know that the price there is a price difference because one is considered on-road use and one is considered off-road use and with that you know you have to there's the additional fueling and so you know you could go and fuel up your truck and then do a trailer swap and then pick up a reefer unit and if that reefer unit is less than a quarter tank of fuel and you know that you need to run that reefer unit guess what now you got to take an extra trip, an extra fuel stop, just to top off that reefer unit. And a lot of places will require you to top off that reefer unit before you drop it off at a facility for it to be loaded or unloaded. You need to drop it off with over a half a tank of fuel or three quarters of a tank of fuel. Uh, that will be included in your dispatch and they will let you know before you drop this off, you will drop it off with X amount of fuel or more uh, a lot of these cold storage places and a lot of these facilities will turn you away if your reefer unit is low on fuel. So, a little bit more complicated. You have another another thing to deal with to keep in mind that um, you got to manage that fuel on the reefer unit as well. Trailer washouts. Trailer washouts are uh, required with food grade loads. If you run a regular load and you've got debris and everything else in your trailer um, you might have to go and take it 25 35 miles out of route to go find a trailer washout facility you may have to spend a couple of hours in line at blue beacon or any of these tra trailer truck wash places just to get that trailer washed out if you're going to go to tyson or xl beef or any of these major food manufacturing plants that um you're going to be hauling food because of you know the department of health and everything else they don't want you showing up with a dirty trailer bacteria 
and stuff like that. If you run a Tyson load chicken or beef or anything else like that, it's going to get blood all over the floor. And of course, with, with blood, you're going to have pathogens and stuff like that. And if you show up at another facility with a bloody trailer, they're going to turn you away. You're going to have to go get a trailer washout and provide proof that you had a actual real trailer washout and that you didn't just sweep it out and so on and so forth. So when you get your dispatch, they will let you know you need to go get this trailer washed out before you bring it here. With dry van, you don't have to do that. With dry van, usually you just sweep it out. Um, and if you do end up hauling some kind of weird load, I don't know, that's leaking all over the place, you may have to go get it cleaned out. Very, very rare, almost never happens. With a dry van, you just sweep it out. Uh, and a lot of times you don't even have to sweep it out. So that's a major thing that you have, do have to take into consideration is you have to take additional care to make sure that that trailer is cleaned out. If you're running a reefer unit and if you are going to run beef or any kind of food grade load, it has to be professionally cleaned out. Temperature settings. On your dispatch, you will get a temperature setting and you will get uh, specific instructions on how to set that reefer unit. You will receive training on how to operate these Thermo King and Carrier reefer units. And they have a digital display on the side of the trailer that you will have to set and it will tell you what mode to set it on. If you show up at a shipper or a receiver and your trailer is not pre-cooled, they will turn you away. Or you will have to wait an hour and a half to two hours for this trailer box to get pre-cooled and to be down to the temperature that you need it to be at. Meaning, if that box needs to be set at minus 10 degrees before they put the food in there so that when they're putting the food in there, it doesn't warm up, it doesn't thaw out, and it doesn't start to spoil the load. There's also two different settings on reefer units. There's sentry mode, which is on off, which is not continual run. What this means is that you'll set it for minus 15 degrees and it needs to maintain that constant minus 10 degrees and it cannot vary. It cannot go up above five degrees, more than five, 10 degrees, and it cannot go below that setting. It has to be on continual run. If you set it on sentry mode, you have a target temperature and it can float above 10, 15 degrees or it can go below 10 or 15 degrees and usually it'll run for about 10, 15 minutes to reach that set temp and then it'll shut off and allow that temperature to climb. There are some specific uh, products that you will put in your box that you will have to run it on continual run and they put temperature sensors inside the trailer that when you show up if that trailer has reached a certain temperature they put little detectors in there and if those detectors show that 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 temperature was exceeded in any way shape or form those little indicators will turn red or they'll have some way of, of showing that the that the temp load the pulp temp inside that that box exceeded parameters and you will be turned away with an entire load. It's never happened to me. Um, I drove reefer unit several times, but those are some of the things that you will be trained on how to do. And they are very important. You need to follow the uh, set temp that they want. And usually with these bigger fleets, bigger companies, they have monitoring equipment that will let them know if anything goes wrong with that thing, satellite communications that talk to the trailer and the trailer sends off communications to the fleet as you're, as you're running these down the road. So temperature settings are super important and uh, that will be a common everyday occurrence every time you run any, any reefer load, you will have to mess with that reefer and you will have to monitor that temperature at all times. With a dry van, you don't have to. All right. Additional pre-trip items. So, you know, of course, you have an entire engine and air conditioning unit that is on the front of that truck, and you will have to pre-trip it. You'll have to check the oil, the belts, and the coolant on that, and fuel every day, part of your pre-trip, to make sure that everything on that, on that unit is good to go. 
as part of your everyday pre-trip inspections. Um, not so much on dry van, of course, because your dry van is just a dry van. You check your tires, your brakes, and your suspension, and everything else, and your lights, and you're good to go. <clears throat> All right. So, with, with both modes, you will do drop and hooks, and you will do live loads, and you will do live unloads. Pretty much the same across the board. Dock appointments. Scheduling. Dock appointments and scheduling generally will be vastly different. Why are they different? Well, generally speaking, with these reefer units, um, they want to get that freight in, and a lot of times you will be delivering to markets. And I will bring up I will bring up these marketplaces again uh, when I get down on my list a little bit more here. But a lot of times you will make deliveries in between the hours of midnight to 5 a.m. Before what they do basically is they will take the product off your truck and they will put it on smaller trucks within these these city centers and so they will do local deliveries with these smaller trucks these little box trucks that you see running around these cities all over the place well you'll bring in this big truckload and then they will they will then break that down and they will basically distribute it to 10 15 20 local delivery trucks and they will dispatch those trucks out at around five, six o'clock in the morning so that they can make their morning deliveries and and all of that. But they will bring you in at 2 a.m. because they want that freight that day for that day's distribution. And most of these loads that you will run will be super time sensitive. You will be there. And if you are not there, you are in major trouble. So it is super important that you run all these weird schedules. And uh, yeah, that's no joke. So if you run reefer, you will be running weird hours. And as a team, it's a little bit easier, but um, as a solo driver, you will be running really weird hours. You will be bumping these docks. You will be loaded and unloaded at very strange hours all through the night. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a lot different. With dry vans, not so much. You dry vans, um, a lot of these places that we run in dry vans, um, we can deliver 24 hours a day. Um, and we do a lot of live loads and unloads, just like a reefer unit does. It's just everything with a reefer unit tends to be a, a little bit more difficult. <clears throat> um, so the schedule differences is kind of what we're talking about. You know, dock appointments and schedules. With a dry van, you get a little bit better mix and you don't run loads very often that need to be, you know, live unloaded at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. It just very rarely happens. I've been driving a dry van now for um, almost almost a year and I've never had a dock appointment in the middle of the night. It, it just doesn't happen. Um, with a reefer unit, expect it. It's going to happen. So if you like to drive at night, that could be something that might be right up your alley. If you enjoy driving at night and you enjoy not having as much traffic and all of that, there are benefits to it. You know, if you don't mind running at night and you won't be dealing with a whole bunch of traffic and delays and everything else, uh, but you will be just operating at night a lot more often than you would with a dry van. It comes with the territory. It, it, it's a guarantee that you will be driving really strange hours. And uh, so if it's something that you like, that might be right up your alley. As a company driver, you will be paid exactly the same. As in dry van and reefer, um, you generally do not make any more than you would pulling a dry van. So, you know, no matter what they're telling you, the, the pay structure as a company driver is pretty similar. Um, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that I'm not wrong. Um, you will run more miles. Generally speaking, uh, with, with a reefer unit, you will tend to run more miles because it's seasonal. And when these, when these freight lanes are hot, when the seasonal uh, produce and the seasonal... Um, yeah, it's seasonal. So when you're running produce and you're going over from California and you're running loads all the way over to New York City or you're running loads all the way over to Philadelphia to these marketplaces, you will run a ton more miles. 
um, and you're going to be in a big hurry. So that's one benefit. You could end up running uh, maximum miles, but, but there's a lot more work involved. Uh, and it's a lot more complicated and you're going to be dealing with really weird schedules and everything else so but you generally will be running a lot more miles once you get everything down and you get into a routine and you start to get used to it you will run longer loads yes you will guaranteed as a drive van generally speaking you will be running a lot more depending on your company you will generally be running more east of the I-35. They don't like to go out west very much. Um, and a lot of these contracts that we run for on the dry van side of things are, are a lot more regional. So as a dry van operator, we tend to run more about 1,200 to 500 miles average. So uh, as a reefer operator, you, driver, you will be running a lot longer loads. Generally speaking, you may see a 500 mile load every once in a while. But a majority of your loads will be 1,800 to 2,200 to 2,500 miles. You'll be on them days, half a week to a week. Um, you will, yeah, a lot longer runs. You will be going over to California and Texas. And sometimes you'll go up into Washington to get apples. Uh, it just kind of just depends on uh, what seasonal produce is running. And you will run all the way over to the east coast because that's where the east coast gets all of its food a majority of it not all of it of course you know but there is a lot of uh, of local um internal trade uh inner i can't remember what that's called but basically we uh we run a lot of freight from uh, the west coast over to the east because that's just the way it is a lot of your cattle, your beef, and everything else like that, a lot of your open ranges for cattle and, and, and all that fun stuff, um, a lot of that stuff is grown and raised over on the west, and it's, it's shipped over to the east for them to consume. So you'll run a lot more miles, and it's seasonal. So a lot of your lanes that you're going to run are going to change depending on what time of year it is. And... Uh, with a dry van, we generally tend to not be affected as much by the seasonal changes because we generally will run dry goods, and dry goods are pretty consistent all year long. We push a little bit harder during Christmas, and uh, around January there's a little bit of a slowdown, but there's really not a whole lot of changes with, with dry goods. Uh, dry goods just generally just run pretty consistent. With reefer unit, there's a lot of fluctuations in the seasonal changes and it all depends on what uh, what produce is being being pumped out and where it's being shipped. So that will change quite a bit for you. One of the cool things about a reefer unit is, is that you can run both reefer loads, cooled loads, and you can also be running dry goods because you can haul pretty much anything in that box that you can run on a dry van, but with a reefer unit, you can also run temperature controlled loads. So there's a much more diverse uh, load base that you have to basically diversify what you're doing. So when, when, the, um, when the seasonal changes take effect, you can always switch over and start running dry van loads, uh, but you just can't haul as much on the weight. A lot of the deliveries that you'll be making um, on a lot of these reefer loads will be made to downtown markets, Philadelphia, the Bronx, New York City, New Jersey, um, all up and down the, the, the coast. And a lot of these inner cities, they have market centers. This is where all of the produce and everything gets shipped in and it gets distributed out of those markets in, in, inside the city. So a lot of the cities will have coolers and these coolers are located at several different places all across the country. And you will be basically shipping into these big, huge distribution centers that are coolers, cooler centers. And um, yeah, so those, that's where you'll be delivering and you'll be sitting a long time waiting for a dock. So a lot of times you'll get the longer miles, but you're gonna be sitting a lot more often being loaded or unloaded 
and sometimes of course you'll get dropping hooks um, but with reefer I can't tell you what the ratio is or how it's different with with dry vans um, my stuff with dry van is about 75% drop and hook with reefer I think I was doing about maybe 50 50 um, but I do remember that I did sit a lot more running reefer unit so it all balances out though um, so there are vast differences in the way that you will run and of course that will also depend on whether you're regional or if you are over the road and if you are an over the road reefer driver you will run way more miles than you will drive in additional weight we covered that you know uh, you're not able to haul as much on a reefer unit because they are heavier you will generally stay out longer as a reefer driver unless you're regional or local and uh, yeah just comes with the territory reefers are in higher demand because it's seasonal and so these reefer companies do not want you going home when they're making the big money on on the seasonal freight so they're going to want you to stay out a lot longer so you will probably notice that if you are looking at jobs and you're looking at home time you will generally stay out all a lot longer if you go to work for one of these big reefer companies than you will if you go to work for a dry van company all right noise the reefer units make a lot of noise and if you have your reefer unit uh, running and you have your tractor idling at the same time, what tends to happen is what I call undulation. Uh, this is an acoustic effect that takes place because your harmonics on your diesel engine makes a noise and it has a, uh, a noise wave that will be different from your reefer unit making noise. And so what will tend to happen is if both engines are running and they're sending off sound waves they will undulate inside the cab and it'll go and it'll make all kinds of weird noises um it drives me crazy when i park next to a reefer unit and it's running and the guy has his truck running at the same time it's not quite as bad as when you are in the truck and the truck is running and the reefer is running so it, 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 it takes a lot to get used to. Um, it does take a long time to acclimate to having that reefer unit running. And one of the common things that people don't think about is this does cause problems. Speaking both from experience and from the trucker's wives group, this is a common complaint. After a driver acclimates to this noise, you need to have that noise in order to sleep because you become acclimated to it and you become dependent on it and when it's not running you generally you become attuned to it and you become trained by it and if that reefer unit shuts off you wake up in a panic going oh no it, 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 am i losing my load because if that reefer unit goes down you you instantly you jump up and you and you check and make sure that that reefer unit is maintaining that temperature because you don't want to lose that load when you go home and that reefer unit is not running it'll be very difficult for you to fall asleep because you become accustomed to that noise and you become dependent on it and if it's not running you won't be able to sleep i had to have a fan um a, a home you know at home running so that I would have uh, background noise when I was sleeping at home. Some drivers and some trucker wives have complained that the driver will come home on his home time and he won't sleep at home. He will sleep on the truck because he can't sleep because he doesn't have that constant noise running. So just be aware that that, that is a possible issue it doesn't affect every driver but it, it is an effect that the body does become acclimated to and you do become accustomed to it and dependent on it and it's very hard to untrain yourself and to get your body to not to not need that in order to be able to sleep additional work is required for loading and unloading lumpers you will uh, most likely be paying lumpers at these markets 
and at these grocery DCs and at a, these big grocery outlets that you will show up to, you will either have to unload, help unload, assist unload, do pallet counts, and check the freight as it's being loaded on. And you will also be required to observe the unloading to make sure that they're not saying the product's spoiled when it's really not spoiled. So you may have to be involved with assisting with the loading and unloading. And a lot of drivers, if uh, they can unload themselves by hand, and you can make lumper, lumper money, you can pay yourself. The company will pay you if you assist in the unloading. And so there's a potential there to make a little bit more money if you want to get back there and uh, yeah, lump boxes. That's completely up to you. But there will be more work involved and within uh, within the reefer unit that that's that's going to be a lot more common and with dry van it's it's very rare with dry van uh we are 100 percent no touch freight and we very rarely have to pay lumpers in the one year that i've been with this company i have had to pay one lumper fee it just doesn't happen and uh, i never get back there and handle that handle the um the freight at all every once in a while i will have to put a load strap back there but uh, normally that's all done by the people that are loading or unloading these trailers. Uh, there's what's called a pallet exchange. If you go into these marketplaces and um, some of these places will hand unload your trailer and they will leave all of the pallets on the trailer for you to go take somewhere else. So doesn't happen very often. It never happened to me when I was on the road. Uh, but it is common if you have 24 pallets and they put all of these like boxed beef on on pallets so that they can load it on there and then you go to a marketplace and they're offloading it by hand and putting it on a conveyor they're they're going to send you away with all of those pallets or you may have to take them into a different location to be exchanged for either money um, or something. I don't know. I've never dealt with a pallet exchange. I just know that it is possible that you may end up with a trailer full of pallets that you have to get rid of. So that's real. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk about some of the differences that will be involved with owner operators, lease operators, and company drivers. Reefer unit, uh, reefer freight pays more. On the load boards, uh, if you ever get on DA, DAT load boards or any of these uh, free load boards that you can look at, you will probably notice that reefer, reefer rates are quite a bit higher. And the reason why they're quite a bit higher is because of major, the major reason is because of the reefer fuel. The other reason is, is because it is uh, basically critical freight and there is so much more uh, attention to the detail needed in order to run reefer freight. And um, generally speaking, the loads, the value of the loads is much more, kind of just depends on what you're hauling. Uh, but think about this, if you're running a full load of, let's say, filet mignon, or um, prime rib, I, I, I actually hauled a load of prime rib, boxed prime rib, choice cut, full trailer load as a brand new driver and I picked it up in Salt Lake City, Utah, just outside of Salt Lake City and I drove it over to New York City. It had one drop in the Bronx and it had another drop in Hunts Point, New York. Both were marketplaces and at both locations I had to pay a lumper fee. I had to pay a gate fee just to get into the marketplace and so there's a lot more accessorial pay involved. So you're gonna, that is gonna fetch more money on, on the freight side if you are either a lease operator or you are a owner operator. As a company driver, like I said, you generally will not make any more money. Your flat rate is your flat rate, that is your mileage pay, and you are, play, you are paid, let's say, you know, 46 cents a mile, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. Dad, you make 46 cents a mile, period, that's it. You don't get paid any more for taking it for a trailer washout. You don't make any more money for anything. Um, unless you are assisting with the loading or unloading of the trailer, you don't get paid any lumper fees. 
And if you are assisting with, with product count or anything else like that, you generally don't make any extra money for that. So, but the cool thing about it is, is that the reefer freight as an owner operator or lease operator will generally pay quite a bit more. Um, so for instance, if you're looking at just general freight, you're looking at the, uh, the average rates for dry van, what you'll probably notice, I'll just throw some weird numbers out there to kind of give you an estimate of what I'm talking about here. So let's say that uh, regular dry van freight, the av national average for dry van freight is $2.20 a mile. If you look at reefer average freight rates, you would be looking at 285. So quite a bit of difference, right? There's a, there's a lot more involved and there's a lot more accessory costs that are involved as well. So that, that's usually the reason why it pays a lot more is because there's much more intricacies involved with the custom critical freight. Um, yeah, that's, that's why it pays a lot more. So if, um, if that's something that you're thinking about doing, hopefully this information will help you make a, uh, an educated decision. And, you know, I've driven both. And me personally, and I'm just going to share my personal feelings about it. And don't let my personal feelings about it sway what it is that you ultimately do. I think that you should be... I think that it, you should go out and try it for yourself before you make your own decision. Don't base anything off of how I feel. Because then, you you know, you would be robbing yourself of a great experience, maybe. I don't know. There's some drivers that run reefer and love it. There's some drivers that that's all they've ever ran. I will tell people, you know, give it a shot. And then go try drive in. And then go try flatbed. And then go try this. And then, you know, go have all kinds of experiences so that you can find out what you like and what you don't like. Me, personally, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. Um, but I did it as a brand new driver. I didn't know anything. Plus I was a lease operator on top of that. I was doing a company lease. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I did all the things wrong all at once. So I was brand new. I had never driven anywhere, um, uh, outside of the Western States. And so one of the first loads that the company I was driving for CR England, they put me on a, like I said, that load that I took from uh, just outside of Salt Lake City because that's where their home terminal was, right? So I took that all the way over to New York City and had one drop in the Bronx and one drop over in Hunts Point. And I have never, I had never driven, I'd never driven truck before over the road. So the first time I got on a tollway, I didn't even know what a tollway was. That's how green I was. I was all kinds of lost. I was like, what do you mean I got to exit the tollway to get to a truck stop? What? I thought all highways were the same. Oh no, oh no. And then I get over the uh, George Washington Bridge after I found out that was a hundred dollar toll, <laughs> right? So yeah, anyway, I get over to the Bronx and I'm trying to find this market and you know, I didn't have GPS back in 2000 and um, about 2006, I didn't have a GPS unit at all. So I was trying to base everything off of uh, handwritten directions, right? What a nightmare. Oh my goodness, what a nightmare. I'm, I'm down there in the Bronx at about midnight, two o'clock, running all over the place, trying to find, you know, this uh, this marketplace. And so I had to call up safety and, and actually get help to, uh, to find this place. And when I get there, they're like, oh yeah, you need to pay a gate fee just to get in the gate. I'm like, really? I have to pay a fee to get in the gate? And they're like, yeah, you have to pay a fee. So yeah, I paid the fee. I think I had uh, delivered, I think it was four pallets that were at that drop. And then I, I had to take some time off. So they actually gave me a place to park, which I thought was awesome. And then I actually took my break at night. And when I went over to Hunts Point, um, I, it was about two o'clock in the morning. I made sure and, and waited until about midnight for all the traffic to die down so that I wouldn't have to deal with traffic. And Again, I didn't have a GPS unit, so I didn't know what the truck routes were. And so I called up safety and I had them try to give me directions on how to get over there. And they gave me bad directions. They told me to go down Park Avenue. 
I don't know how many of you drivers have ever been over to New York City. Never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, ever drive down Park Avenue. Okay? If you ever go into New York City, study the truck routes. Get to know the truck routes and do not deviate from the truck routes. You will get into trouble. Yep, you will. So I went down this road, Park Avenue, and I'm driving along and everything looks fine. They don't put they don't put signs out you know, on a lot of these non-truck routes, and, you know, so everything's unassuming, and I'm just driving along, just trucking along, do 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 and I come up to this intersection, y'all, this intersection, there's this big, huge MGM Grand building, okay, and the road literally splits off, and there's a sharp right-hand turn that goes right, and then there's a sharp right left-hand turn that goes left, now these are tight, like you could barely get a car in there. That's how tight they are. They're not made for a truck. And then the other route goes under the MGM Grand Building. The clearance on that, 11 feet. That was 13 foot nine, or 13 foot six, or whatever these trailers are, right? Yeah, so I couldn't turn right, I couldn't turn left, I couldn't go forward, I had to stop. I had to put on my four-way flashers. I'm in the middle of New York City, y'all. Yeah. So what I decided to do is I decided to call the New York City police. And uh, yeah, I explained what was going on. I'll give you a little bit of advice as a truck driver out here. If you ever doubt, if you ever think that you might hit something, stop stop. This is a golden nugget coming from a wise trucker who got this from a wise trucker who got that from a wise trucker. If you're ever not sure, stop. If you think you're going to run something over, stop. If you hear something loud, clank or bump, stop. It doesn't matter if you're going to be blocking traffic. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of an intersection. If you're in the middle of an intersection and you're turning left and you're not sure or let no, let's okay. Let's say you're turning right cuz on the right-hand side it's it's a blind side, right? You really can't see what's going on over there. So let's say that you turn right and you just you're not really sure if you're going to clear that pole or you're not sure that you're going to clear that double parked vehicle that's right there and you're not sure if you're going to take off the hood of that car. Stop. I don't care if people are honking at you. I don't care what you got going on. Stop. Put on your flashers and get out. Because all the way up to the point where you actually hit something, you're fine. You haven't done nothing illegal. Right? Doesn't become illegal until you hit something. And then it's too late. So, if you're ever not sure, stop. Block traffic. Do whatever. Piss people off. Let them honk at you. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Do it anyway. Stop. Anyway. So there I am. I'm in New York City, right? And, yeah, I stop. Put on my four-way flashers. I called the police. And they came out and they said, well, we're, we're, you're going to have to back up four blocks. Four blocks, y'all. Thank goodness it was two o'clock at night. And that's what they said. They said, if, you know, if this wasn't two o'clock at night and you were blocking up traffic, you'd be getting a ticket right now. So I, I guess I'm going to have to go back on my words, right? So if you do end up getting a ticket for being out of, out of a truck route, which do you think would be worse? Running over something or stopping and getting a ticket for impeding traffic? I, th I think I'll take the impeding traffic. I'm not sure how many points I can get on your license or CSA score or whatever. But the bottom line is is that you need to study your truck routes, especially if you're in, you're in uh, New York City or any of these big metropolitan areas. You know, you need to really make sure that you do your trip planning and make sure that you do your navigation and make sure where you're going before you get there. I was going off of local directions that I got from a shipper turn left on this road, turn right and go north and go this way. And I got really confused. 
so anyway um so yeah i i didn't like it i i got away from it and i went over and did flat bedding and i'll talk about flat bedding and the differences uh in another video going forward in the future so hopefully that gave you some insights and some information and uh if you're thinking about trying it out i definitely suggest try it out see if you like it uh it's pretty cool you'll get to see all 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 different kinds of areas because you will be doing a lot longer runs and you will be covering a lot more miles and you will be running some pretty interesting freight you know you're dealing with food everybody has to eat food so you're actually helping feed people which i think is pretty cool so like i said don't let my attitude about reefers uh spoil it for you if you're really thinking about trying it out give it a shot go for it and uh yeah go have that experience like i did that way you can make an educated decision and if it's not for you you can say well yeah it wasn't for me and uh yeah you never know it might be for you and uh, you may love it so all right that's all i've got for right now if you like this video and it was helpful to you in any way and you like me i'm a pretty funny guy um i think i'm entertaining i try to keep everything kind of upbeat and cordial and tell you how i feel give you some pertinent information to help you make decisions in your in your uh in your decisions so please like and subscribe and share and that would be awesome Thanks for watching.